welcome. Welcome to Talking Art. I'm Jane Treger, and we are here seated in the Deerfield Arts Bank, continuing our interviews with local artists. And there are so many of them in the Valley. Today, we are talking to Leonor Alaniz. Hello, Jane. It's Hello, a pleasure Leonor. to be here. So, um, we have a whole variety of things to look at here. And I'm really looking forward to examining each piece. Some of it is behind us, some of it is in front of us, and some of it you're wearing. <laughs> and uh, yes. it's quite fabulous. And uh, first, let's get a little bit of uh, biographical history, like where do you come from and how did you get to this valley? And then we'll talk about how you trained for your art. Shall I make a joke? I've been around the block, <laughs> around different parts of the of United States. I came oh, from I Germany and um, where I started very early in my life, the profession of being a weaver. Then I migrated to California as an adult and lived there for a long time. Went to New York City and went to, uh, to switch to human services and came to Connecticut and became more and more involved with nature and wound up in the Happy Valley because I wanted to be actually close to the Sirius Echo Village. Sirius, yes. Yeah, in Shootsbury. And the longer I stayed here, which is really only four and a half years in, oh. in, uh, in the Pioneer Valley, the more one medium took over from the other, the first medium. Uh -huh. so, so the first medium was the weaving? Yes. So you said you started early yes. in, your, in your life, being you trained as a weaver? Yes. How old were you? Fifteen when I started. Oh, yeah. so this is like... I think you told me your parents said this is what you should learn, right? Yeah, they suggested it strongly and I was rather uh, obedient. <laughs> what what, what were the other options well, for a 15-year-old girl? Well, you know, in Germany the division of an educational path happens at the age of 10. And because I always had been very artistic, my parents thought that learning uh, a handwerk, a craft, would be my path. Whereas I would have actually preferred to go to the gymnasium and be more on an academic track. And that never happened. So I enrolled in a trade school. Goldsmith or photography would have also been an option. But textiles was fine. And in the time, um, in the 60s, textiles were booming all over the Scandinavia and the design influence was huge and so it, it fit. So what year was it that you were starting this this training? Oh, now giving my age oh, completely sorry. away, 1962. Okay. okay. <laughs> so, so how long was your training? Four years, four and a half. Four and a half years? Yeah, it was the equivalent to being a master weaver. And then I graduated as a licensed, state licensed textile designer in the direction of woven cloth versus surface design. Printing is a different metier. Different. Wonderful. So we are surrounded <laughs> on your side of the on your yes. side of the room. <clears throat> We're surrounded by some magnificent examples of of weaving and including what you're wearing now. Um, and I, I, I'm, I'm assuming that our, our, uh, our producer will be putting up on screen a close-ups of some of the things we're talking about. But behind you are, well, can you describe that in fantastic piece of fabric that is hanging all the, the black way and white? Yeah. Can you tell it's, us about that? It's a warp faced shadow weave. It looks like shadow a shadow shadow weave. weave because there is a optical play and like op art with yes. a dark silhouette and a white silhouette. Yes. And um, it is done by having a color segments of only black, white, black, white, black, white, black, white. Nothing else in the weft is actually invisible. So I did it. The but weft is invisible. Mm -hmm. The warp is the, is the part that you put onto the loom. loom. Yes. It's so the that's the black, white, black, white. Yes. And the weft is what color? It's black. And, and it doesn't show. No. The weft is the one that you weave yes. across. Yes. yes. And it doesn't show. No. So it's a warp faced shadow weave, which is actually the same technique as this coat, and that's why I brought it. However, this was, this was first only black and yellow, and then I painted on it. You painted on your own weave? Yes, because black and yellow was actually too eye-dazzling 
and not becoming to most people unless you are um, a person of colored skin, not white skin. So I surface designed it, and the name of this is, is the Tibetan Rasta code, because <laughs> it has the colors. Of and then you added these beads. Yes. Yeah. Uh huh. So these these are embellishments of yes. a different time. Later. This is actually really slow cloth, which is something I advocate. Slow cloth, like slow food. This took probably uh, overall, it maybe um, eight years from the weaving to the finished project, project because my sewing skills were not always as good as it, they became eventually. By you, you sewed this coat as well? Yes. Now, let me start again so we, we all understand. Mm -hmm. This was like the one behind us, yes. sort of, yes. black and white. Yes. And you sewed it up first? No, and then no I painted the yardage first. Oh, you painted the yardage first. Yes, after years of having the yardage and not really knowing what to, what do, to do with, with it. it. So then the green is painted in. Yes. And then the, and then the various yes. colors of, of orange to dark red yes. are painted in. Yes. I did several pieces of that. They actually did become, um, they got some awards, so it's definitely some of the best work I have done and most time consuming. It is completely amazing. I I've never occurred to me that one could do such a thing. <laughs> How, what, is the, what is the dye that you use? Interesting question. Um, it actually develops under sunlight, so it never bleaches. It's called Inco dye. It's made in Oakland, California. It gets, yes, it's when you put it on, it's not green? No, it develops under sunlight. So I painted this in New York City, actually, in a public park yeah, on the How lawn. How fast does it show it, the color? Yeah, uh, it takes probably, depending on the UV rays, from 10 minutes to half an hour. So you don't really know. You have to work really slowly. It is a slow because you don't process. know if you like the green to put it a little darker. Um, of course, I did some tests and I could see how it would come out. So it wasn't entirely a uh, guessing. Uh -huh. Actually, it then became not a painting by numbers, but a painting by shape. And I would just brush Stack it out. Them up. And uh -huh. Yes, and it, I worked within the perimeter of the pattern. It's exquisite. Thank you. It's one of the ritual garments for maybe not a priestess, but something that is really meant to be an entrance maker. And I think I've seen you wear it. Never? No. Never? You should wear it. It would look stunning on you. Not my colors. So what? <laughs> <laughs> it is so extraordinary. As I am aging, you know, I'm more into the, the abalone colors in the softer. So I when did you make this? I wove it in the mid 80s. And then I painted in in the, um, oh um, in California, and then maybe 1993, I painted the yardage, and sewed it 1998. Yeah, there exist two coats. One was purchased, and this is for my permanent collection. And what is the uh, material? It's 100% cotton. This is cotton. Yes. <laughs> Yes, but it's embroidery floss, so every thread has six tiny ones, and oh. that's that made it very um, easy to paint, because I it's see. not it's right. not a yes. crude yarn. It's a very and it's mercerized cotton, so that also takes the dye very well. What does mercerized mean? It's been treated with a lye. It's a higher quality of cotton. It's an additional treatment, uh -huh. and uh, it it's like the old Egyptian men's but uh, shirt fabrics, uh -huh. it's not done much anymore. Uh -huh. So the dress that's directly behind you and others that I've seen like yes. that, that is not thin, thin thread. That has a nubby quality yes, to it. Yes, it's called boucle, but it is a very fine. It's called a seed yarn, seed boucle. It's, it's also it's cotton? No, it's rayon with silk inside. The so warp this is, is not so easy to dye. No, I didn't dye that. I see that you did. I bought the yarns always in the colors, and I did this usually in a wash of many different colors, similar to the sweater I'm wearing, or had the warp very painterly arranged with a change from one color into the next. But this is in the show black and white and red all over, and so I chose this 
to it uh, has the name Zuni, Z U N I, because the Zuni Native Americans have jewelry in just black and white, and I was always inspired uh -huh. with ethnic textiles. But it also is like the barcode <laughs> art now, oh, yes. which you have in this right. show. So it works very well. But it is a very tedious process to set this up. The weaving is fast, and because again, the weft is just one color. The weft is one color. Yes. And the and the sweater that you're wearing now. Yeah. Did you make the pants too? I didn't weave the fabric. Oh, the the, the 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 is this a recent sweater? No, it's not, because I have not woven since quite a while, and we're getting to the whys of that. Uh -huh. This is in homage of Georges Seurat. I was given by somebody fifty pounds of small cones. Every one a different color. This cones, was cones, cones of yarn. Cones of yarn. Yes, cones of very fine single ply wool, which was spun here in Putney, Vermont. Oh. That was at the time when I lived in, in San Francisco. But the Department of Agriculture was interested to create with the industry, U.S. textile industry at the time, a uh, fine soft wool product that would be usable by Canon Mills, for example, for baby blankets. Canon Mills, I don't know whether they exist still. Uh -huh. So it was a pioneer, um, or a first project that happened in Albany, uh, California. And when this was done and Canon Mills decided they could not use this beautiful 100% Vermont wool, which is snow white when it comes from the sheep, they gave me all the remnants and I didn't know what to do. So that's why I brought this actually, because these are all the many colors. And I created in the warp a rainbow here. You see the, so many colors. And then I tried to shoot it with the shuttles almost in the same sequence. So it is like a plaid and it repeats the color changes in both directions. So this is the warp, but this is a different weaving pattern, but was done on the same warp, except this is, for those who know weaving, it's a Bronson weave. A what? Bronson. Bronson? Bronson pattern. It is a nubby one, but this is the same wash of colors across the warp. Now, I see that you do these diagonals. Yes. I find these diagonals very interesting. This whole sweater is on the diagonal. Everything which I have, from except the, the Yes. few pieces. The little I know, as I understand, and I understand from your dresses, mm -hmm. the, the, the hem is not straight because no. you've cut the pattern. The whole dress is going on me, for instance, up this way over my shoulder mm -hmm. and then connecting up to another piece that's doing identically mm -hmm. the, s the same movement but mm -hmm. up the, s the other way up mm -hmm. my back and then it comes around mm -hmm. this way. And you've used the fabric, you sewed the, the, the sweater after you'd woven it and you used the bias yes. cut. It's not really a bias cut because when you cut, that means cutting into the fabric. I used the whole cloth. Can I you made, lift your arms yes. so we can see? So there was absolutely no loss. Of course, it has the dolman sleeve, which is huge here. Yes. This one has no large sleeve. This yes. is more based on a trapezoid. But the idea is to slice the uh, yardage once diagonally and use the thread then and the selvage in a diagonal manner on the body. What inspired me to do that are two ethnic garments. The first is the sari the draping of the, f the of Indian the, sari, yes, which goes diagonally, and Greek clothing too, uh -huh. um, and then draping it, and then the kimono. The ki I wanted to design a diagonal kimono. So the kimono construction inspired me to fold the fabric instead of using a dummy, like a mannequin, and draping on the mannequin. So I work in a scale of one to 10, and use, I still do, paper strips and fold it use it as a flat medium, yes. the cloth. Mm -hmm. And so I arrived at this diagonal treatment of cloth without wasting an inch. Without wasting and Then anything. I got a patent eventually, which long expired. Oh, and, uh, shh, shh. <laughs> Yeah, you know, it's fine. Uh, we live now in an age of transparency. And I wouldn't, I have not taught yet, but um, the idea of designing 
clothing without wasting fabric is not new anymore. I was a pioneer at the time in the in the early 80s when I came up with it. But now there are it's the slow couture and the uh, sustainability and movement and all of that is mindful use of raw materials. And so I'm not worried about. Tell me about the dress behind me. That is the commercial version. I still like it as a, a sort of like an artistic design statement because there's a round button in the front and a triangle in the back. And I like the offsetting of black and red very much. But the idea is the same. Because it's also on this, yes, on this interesting diagonal. Yes, there's nothing wasted. The hemline is not straight. And um, there is virtually no loss, not an inch lost of the fabric. It's very efficient with very, I won't say how little, because people might get just too <laughs> eager to copy it. Uh -huh. But um, it's, it's a fit that is good for a lot of body types, but not for all, I have to say. Not all, pe all women would feel comfortable. I have done some men's shirts also. Um, mm -hmm. And they look good sometimes with a round neck, and that's the only piece that's lost up here. Uh -huh. Uh-huh. It's a lot of fun to work with ge geometry. This is not your fabric, though. This no. is purchased linen. This is, yes, commercial fabric. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. So we have a few of them here in the gallery. We yes. have about four of these dresses yes. in black and red because the show currently is black and red and white. Yes. And black and white and red all over. Possibly in the future there could be some in other colors. Yes. So um, you moved from... Let's move from the textiles, although I hate to leave them, to the printing. Yes. And you only seem to print one thing, and that's nature and leaves. Yes. So, so tell me about why. Well, when I uh, came to New York City, and I was a freelance designer, and the uh, craft market, to say, had collapsed by the late 80s. Uh, I left also my looms behind in California. I was uh, taken by the urban forest. And the ginkgo tree was the first tree that really spoke to me. Are you speaking of Central Park? Yes, absolutely. This I is not a natural forest, you understand. It's, it's not. It's a beautifully designed. urban forest, I just, yeah. although I came from the Sierra foothills from California uh -huh. straight to Manhattan, I realized the contributions that trees make in our lives. And it was light bulbs went on. So I printed only with tree foliage, lots and lots of scarves, started a cottage project in Harlem, and became very interested in our relationship with nature and with the importance of doing small cottage projects in the inner city. For for the reasons of economy? Yes, gainful employment mm -hmm. and um, doing it also in a way that is egoless. Because there you use the ego, ego, yeah. ego. No ego. Uh, no ego involved. Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. And no mistakes possible in celebrating what was there. So or is so there. <laughs> is, this, is, this, is this something that you did in, the, in those cottage industries or is this something a little different? Uh, this happened later. Uh, and the one here behind me, is that part of this series? This is, uh, yes, See, this is about six years old. This is an edible, the cardoon, which I got from a farm. This is a real yes, leaf? Yes, it grew, I believe, in a farm in Connecticut, cardoon. Very few people know it. It's an Italian uh, peasant vegetable. And I had printed so much with the tree foliage. By the time I moved to Connecticut, um, which was to work with um, people uh, for the Connecticut Institute for the Blind in their weaving studio and helping people who had physical and mental disability, uh -huh. I really shifted gear. There was a change in me of wanting to go from what was semi-commercial and for art or clothing, more for the art's sake, Yes. I moved to that wanting to um, interact with people. Mm -hmm. And nature was the perfect. How an interesting take on that. Nature is the perfect way to interact with people. 
I think it is. Oh, yeah, that's I have why to think gardening about that. is so therapeutic. Even but often in, in, gardening in is very lonely. Oh, people work alone. Yeah, but the plants can talk. So the nature printing oh. has taught me so much, and that is why, um, for instance, the nettle. So, so is here, there. here we're working. This is on paper, yes. Yes. And this is on cloth. This was also on rice paper. This is on rice paper. But I came from but printing I've seen some that are on cloth. Yes, I printed a lot on fabric. What before. is the medium that you're using? It's as simple as inking the tip of your finger and making But what is the ink? It's an archival ink. It's um, water-soluble oil-based ink. So it's oil. Is this is purchased? Yeah. Where do you find such a thing? From art supplies. And Not and so much from the one in, in his town, but um, online. Uh -huh. I don't want to mention names no, 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 here. But, but, but it's, it's called... Wat Water-soluble oil-based inks. Printer's inks. And you have a clean, you can wash oh, them up with is water. This, is this the printer's ink that... We, it's not the printer's ink that you would do for books? No. No, different. No. So it's printer's it's inks for art. It's not an etching ink either. Oh. Monotype... Uh, intaglio, linole cuts, wood cuts, would use something like that. But like there are many different inks, types of inks available. And they're not liquid, they're pastes. They're in pots. Oh, and, and, and so do you, do you whip yeah. it up and make it more liquidy? I work on a palette, yes, with a palette knife. And I work with rollers, sometimes with little daubers or uh -huh. tampons. And you, and you cover the leaf? Yes, depending how large it is and how rigid it is. Uh huh. And With then it's inked, and then either the paper goes on top of it or the plant goes on top so of it. So you the need paper. a press? No. No. So it's you very low you, tech. You, you, you do it with a. Um, hands or feet? With your hands or, or feet? Oh my goodness. Yes. So these, these are not hand work, they're feet work? No, I don't mean to put you on the spot. Actually, but, but all of these it's are very hand pressed. They're all hand pressed. So you This might have been with. This is of one where I put plywood. Put the, this was a very thick leaf that yes. needed to prepare it first, very fleshy. So um, this I most likely had um, between plywood on the floor. And I, ma I rolled over it and then finished it off with hand rubbing it again. But you can only, you, you can't peek to see how you're doing. You can only do it do. once. You do. <laughs> I do lift the paper Little carefully. Bit. So that's one way to learn. This is on a rice paper also, I think, perhaps? Yes. Yes, only this one, I believe, is not. So this one has some text on it. Yes. What is the text? Well, the text is a little poem that came to me when um, I wanted to write about the nettle because the prints that sell the best are those that are co have commentary. And in the Pioneer Valley, there are so many herbalists, apothecaries, and there's such an interest in agriculture and in the plants that either grow wild or are cultivated, that people like the story with the plant. And so I decided to write about the nettle. Yes. So we are just about in that stage of the year when they sprout up. And I found my first and ate the first yesterday. So it's dense greenery claims again that earthen rich plot and invites me to focus on re-emerging, ever-present energy. Aware of the initial sting, I settle my mind and harvest spring's first chlorophyll, barehanded. Into tissue beyond my skin, the nettle brings on summer pleasure, heat I had longed for all winter. And we certainly had a long winter. We did. Yes. We did. So <clears throat> I do not avoid the sting. That's that's beautiful. It sounds like a, a way to go through life. <laughs> yes. <laughs> what yeah. I, I here you have a, a red background. How did you do that? Did you print that first? No. No, it doesn't look like no. that. You can create a background in such a defined way, for instance, by inking a um, a piece of glass or plexiglass yes. that is red yes. and I put the plant on top yes. and then the paper on top and then I'm getting when I pull the 
print. Yes, I see. I get I the see. black from the plant and the red from the underneath. It's, it's very simple. Very simple, but gorgeous. Is the red line drawn in afterwards? Yes. The, Around the, the, the frame. Uh, yes, yes. And then you have a little, uh, what is that called, those Japanese? It's called a chop. A chop? Yes. Might be Chinese, but we call it a chop. A chop. Yes, uh -huh. and these are my initials. Those are your them. initials. Yes. It is actually a rubber stamp. It's not a stone chop. Uh -huh. I tried to do this, but it's very difficult. One needs to order one from China or Taiwan. Aha. Uh -huh. Well, there's another idea for business. And uh, you have a display up now, don't you, someplace? An exhibition? Yes. I do, yeah. yes. It's Tell in the where? Jones Library in Amherst. On the and second floor in that, yes. in that display room? Yes. Uh, how long will it be there? Uh, through the end of April. It's called Anatomy Portrait. And it is, is this represent some of what you have up there? Yes, yes. Well, it, it, and it promises others and others. Yeah, but a lot but it's of all your work. Yes. This one here is there, which is the uh, cow's parsley. And <laughs> I told, I particularly wanted to show it because I want to be a pla plant educator with this work too and people need to know about this plant. It's huge. What Highly it? invasive, came from the Caucasus via Europe to United States and about two years ago there were only about six plants in Massachusetts. It's uh, phototoxic and one must not make contact with it. Oh. And it looks like it. It's magnificent. It's about this tall, has a huge white basket flower on top. Gorgeous. Oh. And irresistible to look at. Very inviting, but, and majestic, and but not very toxic. You should not no, touch it. No, no, it develops under UV light, <laughs> which is, has it in common with this oh, color. How it only exposes the uh, toxin under UV light. So here we have a thistle. Here we have a... No, it's a nettle. Uh, sorry, a nettle. It stings too, yes. This is a what? Cow's parsley, or it's called the Heracleum Montegazianum. Oh, I see something else below. It looks like hogsweed. Hogsweed is the other name, yes. Hogsweed. And then the ginkgo. This no. one is a no. plume poppy. Oh, what do I know? The ginkgo uh, has... Round, more round, yes. It has just this one split yes. in the middle, yes. Y absolutely. The what shapes of leaves are forever entertaining. What, what is this again? It's called plume poppy. Plume poppy. Why, I don't really know, but it has a plume. It grows up to 10 feet, 8 feet easily. And it has not much of a flower, but the shape of the leaf is absolutely spectacular, I think. It has a very interesting geometry to it. How about this little tiny one here? Yep, that's a small one. And this is um, the Acer uh, fruit of the Acer being the maple. And this is a, a grouping of one that is misformed, malformed, and the other one is perfect in the shadow behind it. And there is, I inked it with colored inks, not just one black, similar to this one was inked with green, but here there are other shades and I applied it not with a roller, I used a fine dauber. And then I sometimes take a color pencil if I see there's a highlight that needs to be drawn out, mm -hmm. then I do that. They're beautiful. Thank Absolutely you. Absolutely beautiful. Thank you. They are fun and they uh, bring the plants to people. This is, that's what I really enjoy about it. And, and, and you're going to continue in this vein? I will. Yes. The plants just... The plants. There's so many. Well, I just want one last thing. The hat you're wearing, it matches the sweater so beautifully. You must have made it. Yes, I did. And it's an afterthought. An afterthought, but, but it's a lovely afterthought, and it looks just like you daubed the paint's colors on this. Because it's pointillism. Yes. And I always like the pillbox. I don't know why. The pillbox is a hat, a shape of hat I always like. Yes. Well, it does very well on you. Thank you. And um, I think we've looked at everything here, have we? It's sure. Yes. I've covered everything. And um, I look forward to seeing more of your work. It's it the, from the from the stark black and white to this nature that is so intricate and sometimes so dangerous. <laughs> yes. Um, I feel like it's a whole journey with um, as meaningful as the poem you read. It's mm -hmm. like it's like knowing how to 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 uh, be ready for what comes. 
That's well said, yeah. We need to be ready for what comes. And to be open to it. Yeah. And well, thank you very much, Lenore. Thank and, you, Jane. Um, My pleasure. Mine as well. Yes. And I hope it was yours as well. Um, the, um, the, the pleasure continues each week. I, can, I find new, new and, and old friends and, and artists that are populating our valley and have such interesting stories to share and such beautiful work and varied work. I invite you to use the email at the bottom of the screen to let me know if there's somebody you think I should be interviewing or if there's some questions that I should be asking that I'm not asking. And uh, I look forward to hearing from you. I'm Jane Treger. We're at the Deerfield Arts Bank. This is Talking Art, and thank you for joining us. <laughs>